Okay, so we are live. Hey everybody, how are you? <laughs> Hello everybody. So I'm so excited to be here with Jeff. Um, Jeff and I, we met online. <laughs> it sounds like a weird, <laughs> like a, like a weird love story or something, but that's the way it goes for Amazon sellers, right? <laughs> right exactly. I mean. <laughs> We have such a cool online community of just awesome business owners and um, professionals. So, you know, I met Jeff and uh, we, we got together and talked about your story, Jeff. And it was so cool to learn that, you know, you, you got into law and you were already a small business owner. You were already, you know, you already were, your family had a brick and mortar store and you were already, you know, doing things in business and then you decided to um, become a lawyer and you actually paid for law school selling products on Amazon and that's so cool. You got it, yeah. <laughs> and believe it or not, I thought I was the only person until I met the other partner in our law firm, Paul Rafelson, who also sold on Amazon before FBA. So he actually was merchant fulfilling out of his law school dorm room. At oh the my gosh. During his law school days. And so now you help all kinds of businesses, but mostly yes. your niche is um, online businesses, e-commerce businesses, with protecting their intellectual property, with protecting their assets, right? Anything yes. that they have going on legally, you help represent them. So um, today we wanted to go live and we wanted to talk about patents, trademarks, and copyrights, the difference. Yes, my favorite. <laughs> Yay! My favorite well, subject. <laughs> and it's so funny because, you know, me as, and Jacob says, hello, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I said hi. <laughs> well, actually, I guess he's live. So, yeah. Yes. Hey, Jacob. <laughs> um, so, you know, as an inventor, I definitely have had to navigate this territory, right? Like, I mean, what do you protect? How do you protect it? And how much? That's what everybody wants to know. How much is it going to cost me? You know, so let's talk about the difference um, between trademarks, patents, and copyrights. Can we just start there? Absolutely. So a lot of people get these wrong because they don't realize what they, what they actually are. So let's go with the most basic form of registration of intellectual property, which is a copyright. So believe it or not, anything that you say or you do or you create is actually copyrighted. So like our conversation right now technically is copyrighted to you and I. So, and like, if we create like a flyer, whoever types it up, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Circle with the C, that's, you know, that's, it's copywritten. Now, a common misconception is people don't realize that in order to protect that copyright, you actually have to register it with the Library of Congress, but they're the cheapest because it's about 40 to 50 bucks to do a standard copyright registration. So things like your bullet points on your product detail page, your infographics, your product images, even some of your product designs, those could all be copyright written for you know pennies on the dollar when you think of the on the big scheme of things of what you're spending to launch a business and it gives you real protection against people ripping you off and you you get this really cool sheet of paper from the library of congress so like if i whenever i give presentations i copyright them so i've got like a little library of congress database of my stuff that's so far building up because you know powerpoints are copyrightable there's so many things you can get copyrights on so that's, That's your most such basic. a good idea. I mean, especially for me, you know, I'm launching so many courses now and it would be really good for me to do that. You know, obviously mm -hmm. I put watermarks on things and I try to protect them, but yeah. especially, you know, writing books and stuff like that, it would be really good to do that. So can we talk a little bit about, you said you just, how do you do that? How do you do a copyright? So it's, it's actually pretty easy. It's one of the few areas that I say that sellers could probably like it depends on how fluent they are. They might be able to DIY it, but it's also really cheap for us to do it. So that's like either way it works out um, because you, know, you don't want to have to learn it from scratch, but that's really, it costs 50 bucks. You go to the library of Congress, copyright.gov, and you basically create a, an account and start, you know, filing copyright applications. Um, where it gets really tricky is stuff that's already been published. Um, that's where a lot of small business owners are like, forget it. I don't want to deal with it because you have to mail it into the library of congress and upload it sometimes and you can't do both or else you get in trouble so and if you do one but not the other and they wanted the other so that's where it starts getting a little bit tricky and <laughs> it's even sometimes hard to keep track of for us but we have 
you know, we help sellers navigate that to make sure that they are protected properly. So that could be something that somebody could work with you on one time. And then once they learn how to do it, they can save money by doing it themselves after that, because they just kind of learn how to navigate it in the beginning. Right. That's true. Also, the other benefit of copyrights is that there's, you can bulk upload. So if you, we have a seller that we're working with right now who wants us to do 25 copyrights. So that doesn't mean 25 hours of work. It means taking all of her information and putting it in one giant bulk submission that maybe is a couple hours of work and then submitting it all to them properly for her. So that's a really cool area, you know, way that sellers should save money too, is like if you're launching a bunch of products and you have a bunch of images and detail pages you know you're gonna be creating, save them up as a batch, send them to us, and then get them copyrighted. Especially if you haven't published it on Amazon yet, then it becomes really easy for us to do. If it's published on Amazon it's already, then it's slightly more challenging, but still possible. So why is that? So if I write a listing and it's published, um, it's, what's the, what's, why is it more challenging? So the Library of Congress wants to keep records of everything and they allow electronic records for unpublished material that's being submitted to them before publication. But then after it's been published, they have only certain types of things that can be submitted for via electronic and the rest has to be deposited with the Library of Congress. And so by deposit, that means actually printing it out and sending it into them, hard copy. So you can prevent having to print out and send it into them and you can upload it electronically if you do that before you publish it. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Very so, good. Yeah, so, so that's really helpful. And I know that, um, I know on Amazon um, that the copyright is also a protectable thing, right? Like you can definitely use that. If someone else steals your listing content or whatever, and you have that registration number from the Library of Congress, right? You can say that, hey, this is my copyright, here's my proof, and they will shut that down, right? They will, and it's actually beyond Amazon. It's because copyrights are protected by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So there's actually, in federal law, a notice and takedown procedure that if somebody's infringing your copyright, you can submit it to whatever site, you know, via either Amazon or eBay, Walmart, whoever it is, and you can demand that they take it down and they have to, by law, take it down within a certain amount of time. And so they take it down really quickly. So because I love that because we have people that are not Amazon sellers coming to this conference. We have consultants, we have accountants, we have lawyers, you know, so it's really great for them to know that, you know, your stuff is protectable and, you know, it's just as easy as sometimes filing a copyright. Right. <laughs> it is just that easy. Awesome. And yeah. So that's the first, like the, I say, the foundation layer of IP. So moving on up in terms of the next step up that's slightly more challenging to get um, is a trademark. So trademarks can be either for products, um, you know, like this pen could have a trademark on the brand. So that'd be an actual trademark. Or like this is an American Express pen they have a service mark on their logo because even though it's filed as a trademark application, technically a service mark is what services are. So American Express provides credit cards. That's a service, not a product. Um, although they'd like to <laughs> say it's a product and it's, so that's actually the little distinction within trademarks. There's two. So uh, slogans, logos, words, those are all things, examples of things that can be trademarked um, with the, United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO. And that's another great foundation way. And just like copyrights, if somebody rips off your trademark, you can actually file a claim with Amazon to have it taken down. And when you have a valid US trademark, you can actually take it, you can actually get brand registry. So access to A plus content, fine reviews, everything else that you get through brand registry when you have a valid trademark or service mark, Amazon unlocks the door for you. So. Yes. And even if you have a service based business, like amazing at home, amazing at home <laughs> is trademarked. So <laughs> guess what? <laughs> and so I have several trademarks. I have trademarks for my brands as well as um, trademarks for my service based businesses. And I would say that my trademarks for my service based businesses were a lot easier. Like amazing at home came through like that. It was so easy. And my product-based businesses have had to fight some of them. Like they've taken a little bit longer. 
I think just yeah. because there's a lot more, you know, I don't want to say competition, but in a way there is, right? Yeah. So, but it's so worth it because, you know, it definitely, it's, it's a great way to protect your brand and say, you know, no, that's my trademark brand. And, you know, if you have somebody else claiming to be selling your product, it's a very, um, it's a very clear way to say, no, I didn't authorize that. And this is my trademark. So if you're the trademark owner versus you just making up a brand name and not trademarking it and saying, well, I made that up. Well, what proof do you have of that, that you actually own that, right? Correct. And it's, especially if you're going to go to sell your business in the future, any of these intellectual property we're talking about, whether it's copyrights or trademarks, those all add to the valuation. Because when you think of somebody buying your business, you know, when you make that big exit, what if they're not buying intellectual property, then what are they buying? And when you think of an e-commerce business, that is all they're purchasing is intellectual property. So trademarks, copyrights, patents, those are all essential for your valuation and for getting top dollar. And Jacob wants to know, what does Jeff think about the new Amazon IP accelerator for trademarks? Hmm. I think that it um, has advantages and disadvantages. I think that the advantage is that it gives access to brand registry, um, the tool like the EBC and all those tools. I think the disadvantage is that it also gives access to the report of violation tool and the ability to take down, oh, my dog wants to join the video. <laughs> so the ability to take down, you know, people through that, um, brand registry portal. However, the problem with that is that you're, you don't actually have trademark yet. So if you take somebody down and you cause their account to be suspended, but you don't actually have a trademark, hello lawsuit, like you're at risk now for all their damages. And so like, you know, if you take down a two, three, four, five million dollar seller, they're down for like a month because you decided to file a false brand registry complaint for a trademark you don't own yet, even though Amazon system allowed you to do so, uh, you're the one that better have good general liability insurance because that's going to be at least a half million dollars in damages you'll be paying out. So you oh might my be goodness. Able. I had no idea that it gave people access to that. That's crazy. It does. Yeah. I think it's really a, a bad thing because people think that they have access and they don't. And then the other, the other issue I have with it is just that, you know, a lot of times we work with sellers for suspensions on a daily yeah. basis and sometimes they don't get resolved at the seller performance level and you have to escalate it either to legal or the executive seller relations team and sometimes to arbitration. But a lot of times when sellers think like, oh, I'm just going to call my lawyer. If they've only ever worked with the Amazon IP accelerator firms, none of them handle suspensions. So, and they've got a very close relationship with Amazon. So I'm not certain that an IP accelerator lawyer is going to necessarily tell you, hey, arbitration is an option. They may just tell you, well, you tried seller performance. Sorry, that didn't work. There's nothing we can say to help. And then the buck stops there instead of telling you that you're about your rights to go to arbitration and other escalation paths. So I think that there could be an issue there with the unsophisticated sellers. That's wow. just my yeah, that's crazy. So hmm. we've covered trademarks, which I think as an inventor are really important. And we've yeah. covered copyrights, which I didn't know. Um, <laughs> well, I, I did know about copyrights, but I didn't know that they were as easy as they are to file and that um, that is something that you could do ahead of time. So learned a lot about that. What about one of my favorites, which is also sometimes frustrating because recently I actually lost a lot of money. Somebody had a design patent on a product that I launched and you know, it's impossible to search the entire database, right? You just, you can't. And so somebody had a design patent on a product and I launched a better product. Like it's made out of a better material. It's super awesome and I can't sell it. It got taken down. And so now I have to sell it like locally and just try to sell out of it. But it's upsetting because the, seller of the product that has a design patent made makes their product out of an inferior material that isn't good you know so it's actually kind of a junky product and i've tried to come in and improve it but now in order for me to enter the market with this superior material i would have to completely change out the design get new molds everything done and then take the chance again that there isn't a slight that they won't just try to take me down again with that same design patent. So 
Um, so let's talk about patents and why they're important and, you know, maybe how I could have avoided that situation in the first place. Right. So patents uh, are the hardest to, um, type of intellectual property to obtain. They're also kind of the priciest, which is why a lot of people don't do them. However, there's, there's two types of patents. There's utility patents and design patents. So a utility patent it patents the function, um, the methods, uh, basically how something works or what it does. So you think about like Propecia for hair used to be the brand name before it went generic of finasteride. Uh, Propecia being the trademark, finasteride being the drug. And so that drug, nobody knows exactly how it achieves hair growth, but it does when you take it. And so finasteride was patented under a utility patent. And utility patents um, last, depending on when they were filed, either around 17 to 25 years, just depends on which bracket they were in before uh, patent reform happened a couple of years ago. Um, whereas design patent is covers the design of something, so how something looks. So like if American Express gets a design patent on this pen, and then I decide to take a mold and make this exact same pen shape out of a different material, that would be considered an infringement on the design patent. Whereas if American Express has a utility patent on the function of this pen, you know, a method of a writing instrument where ink is dispersed automatically and blah, 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 that's much very complicated way of drafting the language, then I could have this pen, I could have this pen, all these different pens, no matter or this one. <laughs> that one, those are all covered by that utility patent. So utility patents, extremely broad. Design patents, much more narrow. So this pet, these two pens, you know, this one, design patent. This one, not infringing on the design patent because totally different shape and size. I'm still waiting for my utility patent to be granted. Like that I had, <laughs> it takes forever. And I think I did it. I think it was filed in 2018. So um, yeah, I did the, the provisional one first, which really isn't a patent. It's just, you know, you're, you're entering the system, you get your file date, and then nobody's actually reviewing your application until you file your non-provisional, which is what allows you to go into, um, be considered for a utility patent. So I filed mine, um, last year and i'm still waiting for it to be approved and i'm like man it's almost 2020 when is this thing gonna come through so it takes a while yeah no they definitely do uh we actually have a patent lawyer on our team that all he does is utility and design patents all day long um so like i handle the amazon issues so like the infringement or you know rights owner complaints and then the patent lawyer does all the patent like drafting filing you know enforcement and, and whatnot for the actual patents at our firm. So it's amazing how it. And Jacob, <laughs> Jacob wants to know, do you cover trade secrets? Trade secrets um, in the United States, trade secrets law um, is very, very state specific and very specialized. So for most Amazon businesses, um, Amazon itself has a lot of trade secrets, but nothing that most sellers are doing is earth shattering enough to really warrant protection. Click, knowing how to click the buttons in Seller Central is not a trade secret. <laughs> well, so. and Jacob's in Canada, so maybe, yeah. you know, it would be good for him to look into Canada's it's laws amazing. on trade secrets. Yes, because... definitely check out the Ontario provincial law, because I do have no idea about trade <laughs> secrets in Canada. <laughs> Very good. Well, so we've covered trademarks, patents, and copyrights. And, um, and Jacob also wants to know, oh, wait, we've got lots of great questions here. Um, Dwayne wants to know, does, do design patents apply to digital artwork content, such as a digital ebook? No, but a copyright would. Okay, so in that <laughs> case, you would want to do a copyright for that. And Absolutely. that'll be cheaper as well than a design yes. patent. And then, Jacob wants to know, can I patent a production method? Do we do um, something extremely unique with our cocoa beans? If it's, yeah, you definitely could. It's, you know, method is a type of patent. And so you'd either want to start in Canada and then extend it to the United States using the, the um, International Patent Treaty, or you'd start in the U.S. and extend it to Canada and everywhere else that you want it covered. It just depends on where you want to start. That's a good point. So I have a worldwide patent on my product as well, because um, you want to patent in the places where you intend to sell. 
And then also in the place where you would like to protect. So um, many people also patent in China if their products are made in China. In my case, my products are made in the U.S., so I don't have to worry about that. But um, I, I trademark in China because um, what can happen if you don't trademark and someone else in China can file your trademark and they can actually prevent your goods from being exported from China because they own the trademark. They own your brand name. So that is a very, so you definitely want to make sure that you at least trademark in China. Um, but as far as patenting, uh, I learned that you should patent in the places that you're intending to sell. Now, if you wanted to do a worldwide patent, it would be very, very expensive to patent worldwide in every single country. Correct. So it's best to file underneath the international patent thing that you were just talking about and then actually file in the countries that you'll be selling it, right? Correct. Yeah, because you know, there's 157 countries in, uh, I think on any given day in the, in the world. There's, um, and so when you think about having to get trade, you know, like copyrights, trademarks, and patents, those don't cross borders. So you have to get it for the markets you want to sell. So if you want a trademark, and say you wanted a truly worldwide trademark, like Coca-Cola probably has a worldwide trademark, but they don't actually have a worldwide trademark. They have 157 trademarks, at least, probably much more than that, but you know, 157 just for the word Coca-Cola, because they're gonna, you're gonna have to file that application under the Madrid Protocol for trademarks in every country if you have a patent, like a design patent, like for instance, Coca-Cola has a design patent on the bottle, that shape of that Coca-Cola bottle is unique to Coke, and so they have a design patent on that. They probably have that patented in at least 150 countries. Um, any given day, there's about seven countries that you can't legally sell Coca-Cola in. So they probably don't, don't bother to patent there. North yeah. Korea, you. <laughs> but, and, and that's something that you grow to as a business too, right? right? It's not something that you have to start with, right? And so when I patented my product and came up with my business plan and all of that, that was part of figuring out, okay, I've got to set aside this much money for legal representation for all this. A lot of businesses get started. And recently I did a poll in my group, Jeff, and I asked like, Hey, what's keeping you from growing? And a lot of the answers were that I'm out of money. I don't have the money to reinvest. And I think what happens is that people forget about all these extra costs that they have, right? Yeah. They forget about planning. And someone else asked me, Amy, how do you plan for inventory management? Um, how do you plan to be able to buy the next inventory and, and you know, do that long term? And I said, well, I plan to sell to 1% of my total addressable market in the U.S. in the first five years of my business. So I also plan in my business plan, I talk about intellectual property, the cost of marketing, the cost of the inventory to actually disperse 1% of the market, which is I think 50,000 units. Huh? So, you know, you really have to plan for how much capital you might need so that you're not running out of money the minute, you know, if you just spend all of your money on inventory, then you don't have any money left over. A patent or a trademark yeah. or a copyright is only as good as your ability to defend it. So right. if you don't have business insurance, to be able to pay your lawyer for your lawyer to be able to defend you and you don't have the money to be able to actually hire a lawyer to represent you, then you could really, it could be the end of your business. You could just be kind of stuck and we want you to grow to be that business like the size of Coca-Cola if that's where you want to be. We want you to grow to be there. So that's what we're going to be talking about and inspire. Absolutely. And that's why we have invited Jeff to come and talk on day three, which is our execution day, about how to get these things moving in your business, right? Because day one, we're gonna talk about your vision and setting everything up. Day two, we're gonna talk about goal setting and milestones and your roadmap. Day three, that's when Jeff comes in, we're gonna talk about execution. How do you execute that roadmap? And yeah. how do you consider hiring an attorney for the things that you need to hire for? So Jeff, let's give them one more tip before we end today about how can they save money when it comes to legal stuff in their business? So, so one thing that a lot of sellers overlook that is 
really, really crucial that they don't overlook is what's called a knockout search for trademarks. And so a knockout search is pretty much what it sounds like where you're knocking out names of companies you can't do. So like for, when I was in law school, I had this great idea for a company and I was going to call it Schick. Um, and it was in the pet supply line. And I was thinking, because you know, I was always telling people, you shick like the razor. And I never thought about the fact that Schick, the Schick Razor Company, when I launched this pet supply line, because it's my name, I was like, I didn't think they would care. Oh, they cared. <laughs> so I got, you know, I got notice from them that they definitely cared and their legal team went after me. And I, uh, so the little Schick pet supply business no, no longer exists anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That changed its name. But it oh, just man. Oh, I'm sorry? I said, oh, man, that's something similar happened to me recently. I tried to trademark um, a name with my last name in it. Okay. And a company with a similar name came after me. And they were like, they were not, even though the USPTO did not say that they saw them as similar. Yeah. They came back and my lawyer came back and said, Amy, it's not worth fighting them because they're just going to keep coming after you. It, they were a very large company. They sell in Walmart, you know, and they, they basically told me, even though the USPTO does not see any similarities, and even though you can fight it, they're just going to keep filing oppositions. And so it's better off for you to just abandon it if you haven't started yet. Exactly. So it's frustrating because I did the knockout search. I searched and there was nothing similar, but one big company that sees their name as similar, even if the USPTO doesn't, can definitely make it difficult for you, you know? And the rest of my trademarks that I've had to fight for, I had a really good lawyer and it wasn't all that expensive to fight it. It was just one um, opposition filing that I had to do. Yeah. And I was able to obtain both of those trademarks, but remember that anytime that you file a trademark, you guys, especially in the product-based business, you're going to have trademark bullies. It's a big business. You're there. You're going to have people that are going to try to scare you from moving forward. And just remember that um, always talk to a lawyer because you'll learn after fighting it a few times that it's not that scary and that they're just trying to scare you. Would you say exactly. that Jeff? I would definitely agree with that. And, and having a lawyer on your team also helps you prevent the costly mistakes. Like for instance, you know, if I would have gone forward with the Schick pet supply company and it would have been some great success. And then I would have got, you know, the trade USPTO, like, like what you said, there was no issue. I actually received the Schick trademark. Um, the issue came after the fact when I was in law school and I had, I was working on launching the private label, but it didn't, I had not launched anything yet. And that's when I got a letter from Schick saying that they were, uh, they'd launched proceedings with the trademark trial and appeals board to have the trademark canceled on the grounds that it, you know, violated the Schick um, razor products trademark. So uh, long story short, I <laughs> did not see the value in, in, in fighting it. So in I- fighting Schick. <laughs> yeah, so I just, I let them win. Yeah. I, <laughs> held out the little white flag and <laughs> they, they, they got my mark canceled, but it was, it was a learning experience for me. And, you know, obviously I didn't, you know, a knockout search would not have protected me in that case because I knew about the ship razor company long before <laughs> I filed my mark, but say you're launching a, you know, you're going to launch your own private label product and you want to, I don't know, tell me a famous, tell me a famous name, Amy, that comes to mind or just any sort of trick, like any, any, just a company name. That, like what that, like hypothetical company we're going to launch today. Harry Bo. Harry Bo. All right. So we're going to launch Harry My Bo. favorite gummy bear, by the way. Oh, nice. <laughs> I have to keep that in mind because Amy's birthday is, is at the end of Inspire. So we got to remember that. <laughs> so, so, okay. So we're going to launch a new line of gym shoes and we're going to call them Harry Bo. Sounds really mm -hmm. weird, but it's, that's, that's going to be the name. So totally different category, totally different name. So we've talked to our manufacturer in China. They said there's nothing wrong with it. Of course, you know, they're going to manufacture it with that name. They probably even own the trademark for something else that there is not relevant, but they'll, you know, let us know that they have the patent on, you know, gummy bear shaped shoes. I have no idea, but, you know, let's <laughs> but, uh, you know, cause I've heard some crazy stuff from them, <laughs> but, uh, 
So anyways, what would, what would have prevented Haribo, the candy company, from coming after us when we launched this product is if we would have gone to the USPTO and done a simple knockout search. And what that knockout search is, is that we're going to go to USPTO.gov, we're going to click on trademarks, and then search trademarks. And then there's the trademark electronic search system, TESS. You're going to click that. And then in the first field there, when you choose basic search. And Jeff, I can share my screen and we can do it right now. All right. Do it? Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Here we go. We're going to search for Haribo, right? Yes, but we're going to do it on the, so we're going to start with the USPTO.gov. Okay, so USPTO.gov. Correct. And we're going to come over here. To trademarks, the little drop down menu. Mm -hmm. And we're going to click uh, tr searching trademarks on the second column. Okay. And you're going to see, see that big box that says search our trademark database test. Got it. We're going to click that. We're now gonna choose a basic word mark search. New user. <laughs> and then we're gonna type in Haribo and see what comes up. Haribo submit query. Correct. Whoa. And wow, they've got a lot of intellectual property that we do not wanna mess with. So <laughs> any of the ones that say live, those are ones we don't wanna mess with. Uh, even if they're dead, we still don't, might not wanna mess with them. We wanna to talk to a lawyer first. But you see that one at the bottom that's got the registration number that starts in zero? Yep. That's really old. So let's click on that one because that's probably really relevant. So should I click on the registration number? What should I click on? You can click on anything in those first three columns and it'll take you to the page that tells you all the detail. So, so we see here that they've got a candy that's been in use since 1952. Now, because they've been in use since 1952, <laughs> They're, they're what's called an incontestable mark, meaning that you can't really contest them anymore. Um, the other thing to think about is they're probably might be considered famous. And fame is a new theory that came with the T Trademark Dilution Revision Act. But under TDRA, famous marks um, are entitled to an extra special level of protection. So a lot of times sellers get this wrong and they'll be like, well, Harry Bowes only covers candy. So they're an IC, international class IC30. And they think, oh, so I can sell sh my shoes and call them Haribo. But they don't think about the fact that, first off, we didn't look at all those other ones. Haribo might have a clothing trademark. They probably do because they sell private label clothes. But if they, even if they don't, Haribo has been around for so long that they're probably famous under the act because they're in almost every grocery store and gas station. So you probably, yeah. so they're probably what's called a famous mark, which means that call, even making shoes assuming they've never made shoes or clothing at all, that's probably infringing. Just like Louis Vuitton, you could, you could not make Louis Vuitton candy without it being infringing because that's considered a famous mark. So you just, so you have to watch out for these little trademark gotchas, but that knockout search would have let us know that, Hey, because there's something here that there, this mark is already in use in another category. We need to talk to a lawyer before we launch our private label, because otherwise we might launch our private label, and there's two things that could happen. If you're importing that product from, say, China, and you launch it at Haribo Shoes, they're going to probably get stopped at customs. And you're not going to be able to import them. And they're going to be impounded. And you're going to pay a lot of fines for importing a trademark, you know, trademark infringing product. Or say that you're making them in the United States, Haribo can turn around and sue you. And they'll start off with their cease and desist letters. And then they'll just ramp it up from there and start suing you for damages and you'll have to change your name. Oh, I see you're putting my name in the search box. Let's see if anyone has trademarked Jeff Schick. <laughs> so no records, no one's trademarked Jeff Schick. But the but. problem is we didn't, so this, this could be a common thing that maybe somebody's like, oh, I'm, I'm home free, right? But yeah. you'd want to put in every word. Would you want to put in every word of, your, of what you're trying to trademark? Absolutely. So if it's, you know, and you want to put in variations of it. So like Haribo, maybe you want to use a Y in there, H-A-R-Y-B-O instead of the I. Haribo. So see, you might re look at that and go, oh, must be fine, but not so fast because you have to think, how are the other ways that Haribo is spelled? And if ah. you have that I, you're never going to find that there's a thing. It's the same thing like typing in Dell computers. If you type in you know, I don't know. Well, I don't know. There's probably D. You know, no, there's 
probably like, yeah, let's see, Haribo, like that. Yeah, so you got to think all these different ways that it could be spelled. So it's not as simple as we think, but we definitely want to make sure that um, the other thing that you could do, if you're not sure of the different ways that it could be spelled, you could do a simple Google search and yeah. spell it incorrectly, and Google will try to autocorrect it for you. And so then you can go, oh, wait, oh, you know, did you want to know about this? Because I'm sure if we put Jeff Schick into Google, you know, they might, we might get a, a Schick website or something there. And that should tell us like, oh, okay, wait, we want to check to see if that's trademarked because that could be a problem, right? So Absolutely. you could use a combination of those two things. Because I bet if I put Harry Bow like this into Google, it will... Um, Ask me if I meant, look at that. Did you see in the, yeah, the did, you, yeah. did you mean Harry Bow? Exactly. So definitely, you know, you want to make sure that you are checking all of those things when you're doing your knockout search. Um, so I think that this has provided great value to everybody tonight. I know we've had a lot of comments. People have said, thank you so much for all this information. Um, we hope to see all of you guys at Inspire. Remember, we only have 100 seats. So make sure you take advantage. We have right now the biz build code. So if you use code biz build at checkout right now, you get our business builder night, which is um, the Monday night for free. So that is a really cool add on because that night is when we're getting together and we are defining our why and to our business. Why not our personal why, right? We'll do that too, but your business has a why. And we're going to set up your vision that night at that biz builder night. So use code biz build. It's only good until December 31st. You've got two more days to get biz build for, uh, to get the business builder night for free and definitely get this on your 2019 tax return <laughs> so that you can get those write offs. Thank and you. Yeah, go I, ahead, Jeff. I was going to say one thing about inspire that I'm really looking forward to that. I don't know if Amy's talked about it with the other people, but there's actually going to be a mentoring session where you talk about how to pitch your business. And we've got some really cool speakers coming to talk about pitching your business and like as if you're going in front of VCs. And a lot of people don't realize that my Amazon business was actually in an entrepreneurship accelerator when I was at Cornell. So we had to do this exact same thing and pitch in front of all these like Silicon Valley venture capital firms who at the time had no interest in Amazon businesses and now probably are shooting themselves in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> because they see what's going on but it just goes to show you like I can't wait like I know I think I'm going to help with one of the tables like I can't wait to show, share what I learn and then he help people define their vision and how do they pitch to other you know VC firms or pitch to other investors angel investors from the family and that's going to be super cool for especially the people that want to exit their business and truly unlike any other conference out there this year so yes. it makes it a 2020 must attend conference in my book Thank you so much. Yeah, we're definitely going, that's the pitch perfect workshop. And we're going to do, we're going to have a pitching session during the day where you're going to learn about pitching. And then at night at the pitch perfect workshop, we're going to have all of our mentors there. And then our participants, our attendees are going to get to practice their pitching and we're going to do some workshops. So it's going to be so much fun and it's going to be at the hotel that night. So we're going to just get to relax and you know, we, we're thinking of, you know, like kind of like the voice where we, we're going to take some of our top pitches and um, let some, some folks, you know, compete on those and just have a good time and build each other up and really just leave with that confidence of, yes, I can do this. I know for me, I, I do want to sell my brand um, here in a few years as soon as I get it um, in a few more channels. And that's yeah. really going to be important, not only for talking to buyers, but also talking to people that are potentially going to buy my business. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm so excited about that. Yeah, no, I'm excited too. I think this is going to be a really awesome conference. So I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Yay. All right. So you guys know now bring the Harry bow sour gummy bears <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I've use code sour gummy bears now, So I can't wait to try that one. Yes. I love them. They're my favorite. I probably <laughs> eat way too many of them. So <laughs> Well, right. thank you guys so much. And thank you, Jeff, for being here with us and yeah, for giving you. us all that great information. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Amy.
All right. We'll see you guys soon. Bye, everyone. Have <laughs> Bye. a good night.